Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show with your hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Phil and Ted's guest today is comedian and actor Kevin Pollack, known for his standout roles in films and television, including A Few Good Men, The Usual Suspects, his own HBO comedy specials, and the hit TV show, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And now, your sexy boomer hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, Bunker to Bunker. Thanks to the pandemic, we are all secluded in our individual bunkers, and today we're welcoming actor, impressionist, and comedian Kevin Pollack. Yes. He's been in every film imaginable, but you probably know him best these days for the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. He plays Moisha Maisel, the uh, hilariously obnoxious father-in-law. Yeah, typecasting. <laughs> uh, but he's an, he's an extraordinary man with an extraordinary uh, career. Well, let's join him in his extraordinary bunker. The one, the only Kevin Pollack. Thank you. Well, actually, I think we're welcoming the one, the many, yes, Kevin Pollack. <laughs> Thank you. Really, if we look back at your career, sure. you, you have an incredible uh, array of talents that you've been able to exploit quite well which is rather unusual. And you started as a stand-up when you were very young. Is that right? Uh, correct. Continue. Small Jews for 400. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Wikipedia said you were 17 years old when you started in San Francisco. Is that the kind of show I'm doing where the information comes from Wikipedia? Yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that's why you can correct yes. the information. <laughs> right? uh, I think Wikipedia also says I have two children, which I don't. It also says, Kevin, that you share your birthday with your father. That part is true. Yeah. And wow. in fact, um, that sounds, you, your reaction is what I would hear throughout my life. Wow. wow. Yeah. It sounds great to share a birthday with your father. But in fact, um, it was horrible because, uh, you know, your birthday is supposed to be about you. Yeah. And I get to share mine with dad. You know, sure, some <laughs> years we celebrated how uh, I wanted to. But most years we just, you know, ended up at the track. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about that. I was thinking, yeah. I don't. I think that's a mixed bag at best. Yeah, and at the track, my father would say, uh, "Hey, don't worry about a kid. If number five comes in, you get that tricycle you've been bitching about." <laughs> uh, I don't know why my father sounds like Brian Doyle Murray, but there it is. Well, that's where you get your sense of humor, I guess. Right? That's right. Self defense. Mm -hmm. right. I once had a girlfriend <laughs> whose birthday was a New Year's Eve, and she was traumatized because everybody counted down to the end of her birthday. And it was tough for a little girl. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my mom held off on my birth until the the next day because, you know, there's that thing, Monday's child is full of woe, Tuesday's child is far to go, et cetera, et cetera. She wanted to hold off until I think it was Sunday when I was full of grace. I ended nice. up being full of shit, but that's, you know, not her fault. <laughs> but Yeah, great job, Mom. A lot of your own podcasts have gone viral. So if you don't mind, I'm going to wear this mask. While I sure. talk to you, just in case you can't be too safe these days, you know, you can't. No, I'm wearing two condoms right now, as a matter of fact, <laughs> as a fan of, of Maisel. Uh, yes. God, you're so funny. And thanks for all the laughs. I mean, really hearty laughs. What a thank you. What a terrific show that is. I, it, every episode looks like a feature. Yeah. The um, the sort of uh, heightened reality that was created by our uh, the, uh, Amy Sherman and Dan Palladino the creators of the show and showrunner. Yeah. Um, and every department head comes from high atop. And um, there's almost no way to screw it up. You know, it's uh, you, you just want to absolutely know your lines and not bump into the furniture as we were instructed. Um, <laughs> especially when you're doing eight page oneers and there's 14 moving parts, you don't want to be the one who bumps into the furniture um, inadvertently. Unless, Kevin, you're giving it a tush test. That's exactly right. The tush right. test has resonated. Is it a uh, a longer production schedule because of the quality of, of production? Yeah, yeah. We're definitely spending more than your average bear on uh, time-wise and certainly, uh, I imagine, financially. Um, per episode, you know, an hour show, I think, averages anywhere from seven to nine days, maybe ten. Mm. We're, we're shooting a minimum of ten. Um, and, uh, you know, look, they... Um, They've gotten nothing but utter support from the mothership, in this case, Amazon. And uh, 
Um, they wise Amazon wisely um, really doesn't give notes. They um, they uh, give a lot of encouragement and support. Mm -hmm. um, and I really feel like this this magical world that I've been invited into mm -hmm. uh, just continues to be a winning lottery ticket. Uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. fortunately you get to an age where you can actually appreciate every square inch of it, yeah. and every every waking moment of it, and that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and there's an utter appreciation and gratitude and all the cast, even the younger actors feel the same way. And you know, we've only done three seasons. So give us time in terms of turning on each other. But so far <laughs> it's been a love fest. Some of the scenes, I can't even figure out how they do it are the recreations of the, the periods. And I, you know, I, it, painstakingly is all it, I can tell you. Well, yeah, I, it, I can, it, I can mention it. something about that. Cause I was in New York, Kevin, when you were shooting something there and I was staying, we're staying in a Times Square area and they had all these great old cars lined right. up for blocks and blocks. Yeah. And I went, Oh my God, you know, the, that detail and that love was yeah. just, just thrilling. In the wardrobe too is all of our everything we wear is built for us individually and oh, um, wow. which is ridiculous and almost unparalleled. Um, you know, it makes sense that they would build all of Rachel's character costumes. Yes, her, her character, of course, uh, not only the lead of the show but the look of mm -hmm. the show sort of starts with hers. But no, it's 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 every single one of the series regulars. You know, there's a wardrobe fitting that is normal, but a bit abnormal in its its depth of uh of uh detail, detail. Yeah. right but your character moisha uh i mean talk about fertile territory the character so obnoxious at times some of the scenes in the last season when they had to move into your home mm. and the the friction yeah i just couldn't imagine how many uh takes you lost for cracking up um yeah that we we lose a goodly amount and also they like to do these long Long oneers, they call them, mm -hmm. uh, eight page oneers. Um, and the many have been spoiled by by laughter. And, and um, you know, it's it's part of the thing, part of the process. You don't want to be the one who spoils the cake, as I said. But what you're um, distorting. I all I touched was my nose, and we're not supposed to, so maybe that's what caused yeah, don't it. Don't touch your face, that's right. Yeah, what, what are you doing in the bunker? Um, have you gotten cabin fever yet? No, I think uh, we've we've um, we've only gone out for the essentials, but we do go out for the essentials with masks and gloves. We we go on daily walks when the weather permits. We make a point of of being twenty feet away from each other, not each other, <laughs> but, but but everyone else. Um, yeah, so I know people. We had our first uh, Mrs. Maisel cast Zoom uh, ah. ha hangout. And I, that's how I found out that Tony Shalhoub and his wife, Brooke Adams, wonderful actress and artist, as well as Rachel, our, our lead, and, and her husband, Jason, have gone through the virus and come out the other end. Wow. Um, the, you know, there's, a, there's always been a conversation about the, the numbers, right? The high, extraordinarily high percentage of people who get it are going to be okay. But yes. it seems so damn ram, random in terms of who it decides to kill, that no one feels safe, safe no matter how healthy, what age, whatever. Um, even though the, you know, the, the information keeps coming in. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're doing our best to stay healthy uh, physically. We don't remember ever cooking and cleaning to this degree, ever. Mm. Mm. Uh, if that's the worst thing that happens, we got off very, very lucky. Are they in New York? Uh, yes, there's very few of us here in L.A. I think Maren Hinkle, who plays um, Tony Shalhoub's wife, Rose um, mm -hmm. Weissman on the show. She lives here in L.A. Um, Archie, played by Joel Johnstone, who is our son's best friend mm -hmm. uh, on the show. He lives in L.A. But everyone else is in New York, yeah. Mm. And are you in actual suspension now? Of uh, were, were you pl were they planning to shoot some more stuff, and then they pulled the plug on it? We were in a existing hiatus already. Um, Good. Yeah. The question is, how do you? How long before fifty, sixty crew members are comfortable gathering on a soundstage, which is where we shoot the bulk of the show? And Amy and Dan are the creators of the show and runners. Um, we're saying in the Zoom thing, how long before we can shoot on location outside where we shoot mm -hmm. a lot of the show as well, where, where, you know, 
sure, everyone yeah. is going to wear a mask. So I think, I think they are, and have been already. And this is probably true of every show that's and movie that's waiting mm -hmm. to shoot. You know, everyone is trying to crack the code on this one in terms of how does a crew go back to work. Um, I think everyone wants to be respectful to the rules. Um, and cabin fever aside, uh, everyone wants to go back the smart way and not rush back as much as the president would like us to. Well, you know, even on our street here, there are people who walk their dogs and they are now, uh, the dog's faces are covered with scarves. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the people are being perhaps a little too careful. Yeah. Well, not if they have a big cat. Evidently, the cats at the Bronx Zoo have caught it. Well, yeah, yeah well, it was just announced. Um, mm -hmm. Who was I watching? One of the talk shows. Oh, Steve, Steve Colbert, who's done a phenomenal job. Hasn't he been amazing? I just We love him. Love him. God sent. Uh, yeah. said said the atheist but uh um he he mentioned cats in general can get this um we are cat people they are indoor cats so they stand as the same chance i guess as we do unless we bring it back to them um but it does dampen my my hopes of doing my own version of tiger king <laughs> now i want to ask you a question if, if you don't yeah. mind him change the subject uh i've been doing some comedy stuff with jamie alcroft who I uh, love dearly. Yes, and and I've seen a lot of the shows that you did with them, uh, Mac and Jamie, the comedy break, break right? Yeah. Now, and that was apparently a really backbreaking schedule. You did a lot of shows, you know, in a short period of time, and played a lot yeah. of different characters. What did that feel like? Um, it was magical for me, and as it turns out, as close as I was going to get to a a, a televised sketch show. Uh -huh. um, uh, we, it was, um, I guess now they would call it block and shoot back then. They didn't have a name for it yet, mm -hmm. but yes, it was a strip show on five nights a week, comedy break with Mac and Jamie. And so we had to do sketches every night and, and the writers did what they could and the best that they could. But in terms of building sets, at some point they decided, let's just put black tape on the floor and, and on, and in place of a couch and not try to do uh, set design. <laughs> yeah, I and, know. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what it would look like now. I, 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 I thought that it, we, we did our best to be funny, but for me personally, you know, it was very, very early in my alleged career, and so I got a chance to be on a sketch show. I've seen a bunch of those shows, and it really works. It's actually kind of part of the comedy, you know, because it well, focuses your attention on the characters. Right. Well, it's a relief to hear that you, one of my all-time sketch heroes, uh, oh. thought that the show works because uh, uh, there, there's, there's no greater uh, compliment that I could think of, quite frankly. Well, that's very sweet of you. Most of the sketch work that I did with like the Firesign Theater yeah. was, was not televised because no. we were too scary. We scared them. You know? Well, I only knew it from the albums, and uh, it was life-changing for me as much as Mad Magazine or, or, or any introduction to subversive, um, witty comedy. And um, I, you know, I, I think I, when I had you on the chat show, I, I, yeah. to this day, um, I always, you know, there's just certain lines that stay with you. Um, Carruthers, why don't you leave us alone? How much would you like? 5000 10000 <laughs> <laughs> May I take your goat and jacket off, sir? Right. Yeah. You know, coo 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 choo. Um, uh, well, that's very flattering. And, and of course, those performances in the studio yeah. were like out of town tryouts because yeah. we would write, uh, write all this stuff ourselves very arduously sometimes and come to these hard compromises, go into the studio start playing it and throw the script away. Wow. And improvise wow. it, you oh know, my God. and, it, and we had, and we had all the freedom to do this. Now, uh, uh you're, uh, you've done 80 movies. I don't know the exact says. number 91, but I will say that, uh, <laughs> six of them are quite good. Yeah. <laughs> but that whole experience, that whole experience of making movies, though, uh, you, you're stepping into, you know, especially if you're not doing a lead role, you have to step into it. And that can be very nerve wracking. But uh, you, you seem to have mastered 
it by perhaps your sense of humor. I don't know. Yeah, I had no formal training as an actor. I'm not terribly proud of that. It just happens to be a fact. And and um, but I had faced so many audiences as a stand up comedian that rejection, which is uh, pretty much what an actor does for a living before they get a job. Yep. Uh, while waiting for the next job is face rejection. Um, I was I was not impressed by people at when I had to audition, I wasn't impressed by their lack of interest. I'd faced it too many times as a comedian on mm -hmm. stage. Um, so that served me a little bit, but I, I definitely went on hundreds, no exaggeration, yeah. uh, of auditions before anything took. And then, mm -hmm. as I've learned from having brilliantly talented friends over the years who just didn't have that one we can call it lucky, fortunate yeah. situation. Yeah. Right place, right time. I did, and I was having lunch every day with Rob Reiner while working on a very subversive little summer series that he and Christopher Guest created that that almost no one saw called uh, Morton and Hayes. But while we were shooting it every day at lunch, he would we would talk, and um, one day he said, uh, it looks like this next movie I'm doing was a Broadway play called A Few Good Men. I got... Um, mm. Jack, it looks like we're going to get Jack Nicholson to play the crazy Colonel, uh, Tom Cruise. I said, wow, Rob, this is amazing. And he said, and there's a part of Rob, of Tom Cruise's co-counsel that you're perfect for. I have an offer out to Jason Alexander, but if Seinfeld gets picked up for its second season, Jason won't be available. And at that point, it was a big question mark. Seinfeld was on Friday nights. It was called the Seinfeld Chronicles. They'd only done four episodes. Nobody yeah. was watching it. I remember that. And it looked, in fact, like there was no way it was getting a second season. And it was only, in fact, my prayers <laughs> <laughs> that pushed it through. A little and, Rosemary, Rosemary's baby there, huh? Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> things worked out for Jason Alexander and I rather well. But, but that, movie, that movie is really what uh, allowed me to go from auditioning to getting offers. And then, of course, everything changes. Um, yeah. And, and also changed for me as a stand-up comedian because as a stand-up, when there's an offer for stage time, the answer is yes. There's no never any question or even conversation. If there's a chance to perform, the answer is yes. So as an actor, when I started getting offers, mm. I had that same mentality, and I was a girl who couldn't say no. Consequently, I did about 40 movies in the 90s, and I promise you six of them are really, really good. <laughs> uh, to repeat that joke, but it really does come down to, to the absurd bulk of films I did in the 90s. Um, and you do a lot of impressions, a lot of impressions. And maybe that's where I learned how to how to act, because when I did mm. impressions, it was important to me and it remains important to uh, to build from the shoes to the hat uh, what the physicality of that character was. And 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 because of that, even from a young age, it became sort of a possession when I do mm -hmm. voices, I, I think as the person. So Albert Brooks was my single uh, comedic hero my mm -hmm. whole life and um mm -hmm. when i do albert brooks i think faster and funnier when doing mm. him than i do in my own voice wow uh, just to give you an idea of the sort of possession that takes place so because of that i think i was learning how to act without going through classes mm -hmm. indeed Indeed. It's in a way when you do a character you're putting on a mask which sort of frees you up, right? Of all yeah. self consciousness and Yeah. Consequently I, I lack certain technique. I can't cry on command. I can't do a lot of things that theater trained actors can do. I do notice that I have a little more fun on set than most of them. <laughs> yeah. And you know that's infectious. Yeah. So we we can see that. Yeah. We can see your the little twinkle yeah. in your brain there. Well and, Mo and... Moish Maisel, um yeah. According to my better half was a part I was born to play. To me, I agree. I, I'd never played a loud, obnoxious Jew before, so I'm not sure how to take the compliment. <laughs> but I'm also channeling uh, the great Lou Jacoby, who I worked with in Barry Levinson's film Avalon. Mm -hmm. um, he was the a character in that film who said, you cut the turkey without me, you know, if you know yeah. the film. And if you don't, yeah. he was also the actor who said, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Oh, yeah. He had an extraordinary yeah, yeah. career, but he, in a lot of films, including Avalon, he played a very loud, obnoxious Jew. And um, so I am channeling him for sure, and I, I, I'm enjoying the hell out of it. Whenever you walk in on a scene, it's like this energy field comes in with your character. Like, oh, God, here it goes. It's going to, you know, it's going to go 
sideways loud fast. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about uh, working on a, a, a sets in New, in New York, but what I, one of the things I love about the show is the locations that yeah. they found, the location shooting. Uh, it, 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 it's it's really. Uh, when you're in Vegas, you're in Vegas. When you're in the Catskills, you're in the Catskills. Yeah. Yes, or is that all an illusion of some sort? Yes and no. Um, they when the show sh uh, did shoot in Miami for a couple of weeks for season three. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it did shoot in Paris uh, for the two first two episodes of season two. That's nice. Uh, the Vegas interiors were built uh -huh. uh, uh, in Queens, I think. Wow. Some, somewhere in Queens. Um, Beautiful. Uh, the Maisel's home is in, uh, Forest Hills, as I think it was said in the show. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And we dress a lot of New York for, for our period piece needs. My character's, um, uh, garment business, mm -hmm. uh, is an existing place. I think it's been around since the twenties and has built suits for famous and infamous and presidents and, Wow. But they also ended up building a smaller version of that on a soundstage uh, for later seasons where... Wonderful. Yeah. So it's a, a bit of both. The Miami stuff. Extraordinary. I was trying to figure out how did they do that because I remember going to Miami Beach in the, in the mid-60s as a kid and it really took me back. Not only is that really fount the Fountain Blue Hotel. It is. It is that's yeah. where we stayed. It yeah. is the actual... Yeah. But people consequent or subsequently after the show dropped early December, when people went to the Fountain Blue Hotel, they wanted to know where the the Maisel stairs were, where the ah. suite was, and, <laughs> and I think they set up some period sort of displays within the hotel to celebrate. But that was all soundstage, the the stair scenes and all that. Is nope. that what you're saying? No, oh, I'm not. That was actually at the Fountain Blue. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, that that explains a lot because it just seemed too authentic. Yeah, everything in Miami was authentic. The Catskill stuff was shot at the Scott Family Resort, about three and a half hours out of New York City. Ah, uh, not uh, geographically in the Catskills, but a similar setting and a a real a big family resort. Yeah, it was very convincing and fun. You know, oh man, it. it was like an away game for the crew and the cast because we all, oh, yeah. so oh, far yeah. out of the city, we all had to stay out there and it's in a little <laughs> tiny town um, where we all the same little tiny Holiday Inn or whatever the hotel was, I don't remember, but um, that was kind of funny. Oh, that's and, fun. And ridiculous, yeah. When I hear that they're going to go to Vegas, I'm actually looking forward to it because I want to see Vegas. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. That's and how authentic it is. You know, it's like, I don't care how they do it, yeah. but I know I'm going. And they keep expanding the world season after season and mm -hmm. um they just shared the the sort of season arc and a couple storylines with amazon for season four and um apparently amazon executives are thrilled and whenever we're allowed to reassemble we will uh we will do so you're listening to phil and ted's sexy boomer show with your hosts Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet, and their special guest, comedian and actor Kevin Pollack. We'll be right back. 153 years ago, a group of desperate criminals were transported to the barren shores of Australia and gave birth to a second-rate nation and a first-rate beer. But really great beers aren't just born. They evolve. Yo, bro, what's this brew? Ha-ha! <laughs> <laughs> it's Darwin Select, mate. Have one, it'll make a man out of you. Have another, it'll make that man into a monkey. <laughs> Throw another on the bar, Bill. The Surgeon General has determined that alcohol kills brain cells. But only the weak ones. <laughs> Darwin Select, a proud product of Brown Rainbow Brewery, Down Under, Australia. You're listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. To hear all the Sexy Boomer Show episodes and get your hands on our Sexy Boomer bumper sticker, visit SexyBoomerShow.com and look for Sexy Boomer Show on Twitter and Facebook. And now, your hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet and their special guest, comedian and actor Kevin Pollack.
Kevin, you keep yourself very busy. How long did you do your podcast and your TV podcast? Well, yeah, we were we started in 2009. We went 10 years, exactly 400 episodes. I was wow. a, little, a little lazy because we did it once a week. And so I, I averaged about 40 out of 52 weeks uh, because the first, I think, eight and a half of the 10 years was uh, live streaming video. Um, towards the end, we started doing audio only. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, I loved doing it. I have some of the longest interviews that any of these people ever gave on camera. Um, people like Tom Hanks went two hours and 42 minutes. I saw it. Oh, went, my goodness. Yeah. Remarkable. He's a talker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I got to the point with it where everyone else I knew who also started around the same time 10 years prior where you had to explain to people what a podcast is. Right. Everyone else who did that built institutions out of it and i didn't so i thought I, I should probably let this go but you were really an early starter you started with um i read that you started with uh jason um calcanis uh, a little internet mini mogul jerk yeah mm -hmm. who i met in a <laughs> poker game yeah, that's what you said right i had a friend that worked for mahalo back in the day i think that's where phil i think that's where phil you came was to the mahalo uh, studios yes that's right and it was yeah. very comfortable and friendly yeah. and fun Really yeah, we ended up doing moving the show to uh, the West Side Comedy Theater in Santa Monica, just off the Third Street Promenade. Where oh sure oh yeah, where I now do a live um, improv show that I created another podcast a little over a year ago called Alchemy This, ah, and it is um, uh, five brilliant improvisers that I found at the West Side Comedy Theater that I cast and and. Um, we every week we record uh two episodes around a table not in front of an audience Ooh. and we also and it was inspired really by fireside theater in, in the case that um creating theater of the mind you know that's um, right for for podcasts only the way that you guys did for records um and so that's that's available to your your podcast listeners alchemy this and we do a live show once a month and we'll continue resume those when we're allowed to gather in theaters again at the West Side Comedy Theater. But the Alchemy This podcast is uh, however you get your podcast. Well, that's that's great. You you remind me a little bit, if if I may say so, of Robin Williams because Robin, you know, he he was doing his series Mark and Mindy, right. and then after he'd finish, he'd go and do a you know improvise with yeah. a group of of wonderful people yeah. in some club. I mean, uh, that kind of energy. Uh, I think that's probably what gives you a particularly unique um, talent, a unique personality. That's what I'm looking for because you you keep doing it. You yeah. know, you, yeah, you uh, need to do it. I I you love doing maybe it. Maybe from a sense of desperation, I uh, <laughs> sort of diversified very early on. Yeah, I've been a member of the Writers Guild since 1987, but only because mm. when I was fifth lead on a very short-lived sitcom, I pitched the showrunner an idea for uh, my character uh, for a storyline. Uh -huh. And he said, that's a great idea. Do you want to write the episode? Uh -huh. I mean, that had never crossed my mind. Of course, I answered as if I was waiting for him to say that. Right. Uh, the old adage of an actor at an audition and the director says, you know, this role calls for horseback riding. And the actor yeah. says, I got a saddle in the trunk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when Barry Kemp, who had created uh, one of the New Heart shows, when he said to me, um, do you want to write the episode? I said, yes. Now, I didn't know that these sitcoms are written by committee. And once I handed mm. in my draft, the title would stay the same. The One of the basic storylines would stay the same involving my character and then all of it would be rewritten within an inch of its life. But of course I got a screen credit and I was able to join the writer's guild. So I've always been interested in diversifying. Um, 12 or so years ago, I created a mantra. If you're not creating, you're waiting mm, good. Um, because actors and comedians, if not all artists are bound to the telephone and waiting for it to ring with the next opportunity. So that, yeah. that annoyed me. And I yep. thought, I can't wait for the phone to ring. I've got to create my own. If you don't like to wait, now's the time we're all being asked to sit and wait. Are you able to compensate for your uh, bunkered in situation? Yeah. So as uh, the Alchemy This group gets together on Zoom and, and our individual recording and our, our engineer producer, Doug Bame, um, handles that side. And we've, we've recorded at once a week. We've continued. Um, 
I'm rewriting a few scripts. I, um, along with a couple of other guys, pitched uh, uh, a show, an animated half-hour comedy to a production company. Uh, we had met with them prior, and then we continued on Zoom. Um, so yeah, I, I'm good. I'm not feeling cooped up. I'm not feeling bored. I'm not feeling anxious. Um, other than my interest in getting back to work and back to mm -hmm. life like everyone else. But my uh, better half, Jamie and I have, uh, calmly, uh, hunkered down and, um, have so far so good other, other than again, I don't ever want to cook and clean on a daily basis this much ever again. <laughs> <laughs> on your, one of the things I enjoyed about your, your podcast uh, was the Larry King segment. Ah, yeah, Larry King, yeah. Yeah, Larry. I was once a producer at uh, NBC Radio Network News and Mutual. And Mutual, so in, yeah. Mutual, NBC Mutual was after Westwood bought both of them. And uh, Larry King did the overnight in our building in Washington. I appeared on his show from that studio in Washington. Crystal City. Yeah. It was a weekend, so I was supervising producer, and I got a call on the hotline, and it was uh, it was Larry. He was a, hey, this is Larry King, who's this? And I said, it's Ted. He goes, hey, Teddy, how you doing? Hey, listen, could you tell me what's going on at Belmont? <laughs> I said, hold <laughs> on. And I gave, him the, I gave him the horse race that he was interested in. He goes, Thank you, thank you, Teddy. And hangs up the phone. <laughs> he must have been a big gambler. He was a big gambler out of Miami. That's where he started his radio. Program. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I I cold called his show. Someone got the hotline when I was living in San Francisco, where I started. Mm -hmm. I cold called his show as Albert Brooks because I knew he loved Albert. And oh wow! <laughs> and I, uh, hi Larry, it's Albert. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> and he he after you know I rambled for a little bit, and then he said uh, something like. Um, that's not Albert Brooks, but I will say that's the greatest Albert Brooks impression I will ever hear. Who is this? <laughs> and we started a friendship, and I I did appear as much as you can on radio on his wow. show, on his show hmm. several times, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, remained friendly over the years. And one time I was on a show, and Albert called in, uh, ah. which was incredibly <laughs> funny. Uh, Albert called in and said, Larry, uh, it's me, Albert. I'm listening to the show. What the hell's going on here? And uh, Larry said, he does you pretty good, Albert, don't you think? Well, yeah, sure. Listen, I called my attorney. He has an 800 number, and he said it was, he said it was legal. So what am I going to do? <laughs> oh, that's a good story. Yeah. Won't see him at Nate Nows any longer. Yeah. No, uh, not no for, that's right. You, you know, you, you know, uh, Jamie Alcroft and you and I wanted to get together there for uh, yeah. a nosh. Well, we will. We, we will one of the, when they relocate. Right. God yeah. willing. Right. Yeah. I've got good news. <laughs> yep. Uh, a wonderful friend who I play poker with and her husband um, bought the place and they were behind the move to the new location ah. uh -huh. where the old Wolfgang Steakhouse used to be. Oh, really? That, okay. That's been under... Um, under uh in the works anyways for quite a while and it was really the pandemic that that caused this yep uh and um i think the the, the current plan anyways is to is to get to move it once they're allowed to oh good that is good Great. news that's I, good. I kind of heard that scuttlebutt as well so that's wonderful speaking of poker uh, again wikipedia says that you've been playing <laughs> For 30 years you're an avid poker player they said and right you've been in the ser world series of poker yeah, I've 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 um I've been playing my whole life and I I have been seen on television th through the World Series of Poker WSOP mm. on ESPN uh, uh, several times. Um I play each year um you know wearing sponsor hats and shirts like a NASCAR driver Good. Um, <laughs> because it's a $10,000 buy-in and as much as I love poker I'm not going to set that kind of money on fire from my own pocket. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> I'm happy to play with other people's money. And the guys who play my weekly game actually buy a piece of my action. So when I do cash or finish in the money, as they call it, which I did mm. in uh, this last year, 2019, um, you know, they, they, they own a piece of the horse, which was, which is great. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a great passion of mine. And I continue to host a weekly game. It's super fun. Hmm. You, do you do any charity work? Oh yeah. Yeah. In fact, I'm, I'm glad you asked. I, I have been involved now uh, with 
the first attempt at a national emergency relief fund for the men and women of law enforcement, like a wounded warriors mm -hmm. for the men and women in law enforcement specializing in uh, suicide and catastrophic injury. So the number of suicides now among the men and women of law enforcement is three yep. times, three times the number killed in the line of duty. That's, that's shocking. Yeah. Wow. How, how long has this been going on? Um, it was started uh, by a gentleman named Jeff Stein, a retired medical retired police officer um, in the San Diego area. Um, I, I want to say not quite a year ago, and um, he drafted me, and I've been on the board of directors now for about six months or, or more, and um, just starting to wait, raise awareness and, and funds. And um, I got on the Cameo app to help also sort of raise funds. So if people want to pay to have me make a silly video for them, you know, mm -hmm. a, a goodly portion of the proceeds will go to. Uh, it's called Cover Now. Cover Fund. Cover Now. Cover, cover Now, now. Fund dot org. If people want to go and check it out, it would, I would greatly appreciate it. That's fascinating. That three times the the amount of killed in the line of duty are suicides by law enforcement. That's exactly right. And most times these are one income families, and the family is left with virtually the last paycheck unless the officer's been on on duty i guess more than 20 years whatever the, the pension number is mm -hmm. um but the majority there is no pension and and um, in the rural areas police salaries are very low that's exactly right and uh, they'll throw a pancake breakfast or something to try to help the family yeah that's there's, right there's never been a national relief fund emergency relief fund and that's what covernowfund.org is all about Suicides don't qualify for life insurance payouts, right? That's right. So, so these people are really left in a hole. Why, any uh, studies as to why that suicide rate is so high? Well, sure. There's uh, there's all sorts of information available. Um, you know, there's no there's no quick answer to that question in terms of it's X. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it is attributed to the same PTSD that people suffer mm -hmm. from active duty in the military mm -hmm. wow. sure i mean every day your job your shift you're going on into a yeah life as a kid danger. you know i i felt i always thought of law enforcement as our su our real life superheroes you know they they suit up the way a superhero does they mm -hmm. they, they have weaponry what have you uh, but they're there to protect and serve and I, from a kid standpoint this was larger than life um i i didn't know any other profession where they were honestly um risking their lives on a, a daily basis, if not minute by minute. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, every now and then you'll, you'll hear stories in the news about the bad apples mm -hmm. within the bunch in law enforcement and they get all the press, but, um, the, hmm. like any business my, our business has, uh, an awful lot of bad apples too, that are, that are only recently, um, coming to the surface. So, um, boy, is that true? Yeah. yeah. The, the glass house that we all live in, but. Now, speaking of that, what is what's next on your agenda today, for instance? Oh, so I do have to wrap things up uh, because I have cooking and cleaning responsibilities. Oh, <laughs> oh I see. For the family here at the house. Um, and uh, I think um, I have to, there's an emergency, you know, you can only go out for the essentials. That's right. But I feel like if I don't get some Cadbury mini eggs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or peeps. Cat. For the Catholic in the house. Yeah, you need some peeps too, That's right? That's right. That's right. I've secured the peeps. I've secured the, uh, the. Uh, this is all top secret. She can't be listening. Oh, good. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been it's been absolutely wonderful My talking pleasure. to you. And, yes. You know, I feel like we only scraped the surface of your your uh, your life, but it's 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 wonderful to be floating around on on top of that iceberg with you. It's what a terrible awful. metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Although I feel as isolated as someone who's on an iceberg. So yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> anyway, you. thank you so very, very much. And, and we'll stay in touch, Kevin. And hopefully yes. when this is all over, we can get together. Thank you so much for taking time from your bunker. My all pleasure. Right. Give your, our regards to your cats. Bye-bye. Bye, Kev. Take Bye. care. Well, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. What a delightful person he is. You know, Ted, we're, we're, even though these are very difficult times, we're extremely lucky that at this point, so many of our friends who uh, have successful careers 
don't have a career at the moment and they're stuck in their bunkers, which gives us a wonderful opportunity and them as well to talk about their life and to talk about the times that we're living in. And it was really fun talking to him. Join us again next time for another episode of Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, Bunker to Bunker. Goodbye. So long. You've been listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, featuring Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet with special guest Kevin Pollack. Darwin Select was written and performed by Phil Proctor and Peter Bergman. Music by Eddie Betos and the Nervous Brothers. Special thanks to engineer Rich Rao. I'm a earnest guy. Join us for the next episode of Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, produced by RadioPictures.com, the makers of fine podcasts for boomers. Okay. Okay.